Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Yuri, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Greetings. During our time together, we've been studying the tabernacle and talking about what it means to abide in the presence of God. And we've been looking at a man from Scripture who is, I think, one of the greatest examples of a prayer warrior that we have, and that is the prophet Daniel. And just to give you a little background, during the time of Babylon, where Israel has been in exile, the kingdom falls, and it falls to Persia. And therefore, there is a new king, a Persian king by the name of Darius, and he comes to power and encounters this man Daniel. And this is how powerful the witness of Daniel's life was. Daniel, whose hunger for God drives him to excellence in all he does, so distinguishes himself among the administrators and satraps that King Darius plans to put him over the entire kingdom, even though he's a Jew. And the administrators and the satraps, they're not happy about that. So they immediately seek to find a basis to make charges charges against him. But the scriptures say they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Oh, how we long for that in our politics today. And what a wonderful testimony to have that these guys are so frustrated because they can't find anything wrong with this guy. And finally, they say, you know what? We're never going to find any basis for charges against Daniel unless those charges have something to do with the law of his God. And so they trick the then self-worshipping king into making a law that cannot be changed. That for the next 30 days, anyone who prays to anyone or anything except to the king will be thrown into the lion's den. And so Darius ignorantly signs the decree. Now, I love Daniel's reaction to this when he hears of it. It's, it's the same reaction he had when he heard that Nebuchadnezzar was going to have all the wise men in Babylon, including himself, put to death. It says he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now, here we begin to see the secret of Daniel's spiritual hunger. And that was that he had cultivated a steady prayer life. Now, this upstairs room, very likely it was not just a normal part of his house. Some scholars believe that Daniel actually had a prayer chamber built on top of his house with the windows permanently open towards Jerusalem. We don't know for sure. But no matter how you look at it, this was a very visual demonstration of his devotion to God. And though he could have allowed himself to become puffed up, and arrogant in this exalted new position that he had over the whole Medo-Persian Empire, he didn't. Instead, we find that the posture that defined Daniel's life was that of kneeling. He showed a spirit not unlike Daniel, uh, sorry, not unlike, a spirit not unlike David, recognizing that he was merely a servant in the hands of God. Now, I want you to picture Daniel kneeling by the window, and the windows are open. Why are the windows open? Is it because he's being defiant? Is it because he's trying to make a show of his prayer life? Doesn't Jesus say that you ought to pray in secret so that the Father who sees in secret might reward you? Don't make a show about it? Well, here Daniel seems to be making a show about it. Why? Is he being arrogant and defiant? No, I don't think so. Remember that Israel was going through a very difficult time right now. They had been commanded by God to worship only him. But ever since they were taken into captivity by Babylon, and now Persia, they've been surrounded by people who are worshiping all kinds of false gods, performing indecent acts, and participating in a variety of incredibly horrific pagan practices. And so God's people were heartbroken because the temple of their God, which they believed would never fall, had fallen. They had become hopeless exiles, wondering if perhaps maybe they should just throw in the towel and merge with their pagan neighbors and worship their gods as well as the Persian king. Yet God had given his people a mighty demonstration of his providence. By his outstretched hand, a ruler of Persia had been chosen from among them, and he was a ruler that had their best interests at heart. Daniel. 
His room with his open windows was a beacon of hope for Israel because it showed that God's providence was still at work for them. That open window where Daniel prayed was his way of encouraging them to remain hungry for God, to maintain an appetite for him and him alone. And they could see that hunger lived out in him where he prayed in their sight, not once, not twice, but three times every single day modeling for them the kind of desire they needed to have for God and his deliverance. But notice something else about this passage. Not only are the windows open, but they're open towards Jerusalem, which, remember, is a very far away place at this time. He can't even see it. Is he doing this because he misses home? No, he's been away for 70 years now. I think he's over his homesickness. Is it because he misses his family? No, his family is very... If they're still alive, they're very likely with him in captivity. Is it because he misses the promised land? Maybe in part, but the scripture doesn't tell us his window faced towards the general area of the promised land. No, it's more specific. His window faced towards Jerusalem. Why is that important? Well, because that's where God's house is, the temple in Jerusalem. You see, Daniel is yearning for God, and he'll never be satisfied until he is where God dwells. In and throughout the Psalms, you can see how God's chosen people loved Jerusalem, how they yearned for the house of the Lord. It says in Psalm 84, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now Israel, for the most part, they had lost the hunger for God, which is why God sent them into exile in the first place. But did you know that Daniel's prayer towards Jerusalem is also a direct fulfillment of prophecy? Remember how Daniel and his friends found favor in the eyes of their captors? Well, this was a direct answer to King Solomon's prayer for them hundreds of years earlier, when he foresaw the possibility of an exile. Listen to what he asks God in 1 Corinthians 8, 46 through 50. It's incredible. He says, If they, your people, sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive, and pray toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen, and the house that I have built for your name, Then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you, and all their transgressions that they have committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. Isn't that amazing? Daniel is modeling for Israel the kind of repentance they need by facing that city that house that Solomon had built for the name of the Lord. In a similar way, so ought we to model for our generation and our culture what true repentance looks like, what it means to be hungry and thirsty for God. Now, the rulers and satraps knew when Daniel would pray because it was like clockwork. So it says in Daniel 6.11, Then these men went as a group, and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. And of course, they turned him over to the king, who, though not wanting to throw him to the lions, because of the law he made, he has to do so. And so he says to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. And God's angel does visit Daniel and rescues him and shuts the mouths of the lions. And when Darius comes the next morning, he finds Daniel alive and has him pulled out and his accusers thrown in. And then Darius says something remarkable. Listen to this. And keep in mind, this is a pagan king. 
It says in verses 25 through 28, Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. And he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Talk about having an impact on the world for God. Absolutely unbelievable. Because of one man's faithfulness to live a life of integrity and holiness before his God, the course of Israel was changed as the entire nation of Persia turned in worship to God. Why? Because Daniel remained hungry for God. So it's amazing to see what God can do through one man or woman who remains hungry and thirsty for him. I wonder what would happen if we could become hungry for God like that. What would happen if you and I began earnestly praying for God to give us a hunger for him and then satisfy that hunger by lunging into his presence, praying fiercely, not just reading, but devouring God's word and setting ourselves to do his work. That's our challenge this week. As we continue in our devotional lives, let us pray that God might establish in us an enduring hunger for him. And when he gives us that hunger, let us eat until we are satisfied. And let us eat even more. And I promise you, both our hunger for him and the level of blessing we allow him to give us will grow exponentially. Let us cultivate a habit of prayer. Amen? Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word, and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.